I could watch that guy. I could watch that guy talk all day. He, he should be a teaching pastor somewhere. I didn't wear a cardigan, but it is kind of like a Mr. Rogers vibe, nonetheless. So. I guess mission accomplished there. Hey, as Ron mentioned, summer camp is life-changing for teens. The cost is way up. 68000 is what we're hoping to raise to cover that cost for families who couldn't otherwise send kids to camp. So if you can be part of that, that'd be awesome. I do want to celebrate that a week ago today was really a milestone in our history as a church. If you've been with us for a while, you know that at Easter, about 100 from our number here ventured 20 minutes south to an Avon location that meets at a middle school. There's a key attendance number that we've been praying would be broken, and it was obliterated last week. But even more important than that, at that campus, started by 100 people who ventured out and other people of faith we've been able to partner with, we've now seen 12 baptisms, 12 people give their lives to Christ. Can we just celebrate that? And uh, if you're here in person, you notice that the 100 seats have refilled pretty quickly, haven't they? And so God is at work. Those uh, 12 baptisms, nine of them are part of 37 so far this year. So if you think about it, in, in about the first 30 days of the year, God brought 37 people to place their faith in him and publicly declare it. Church, I'm just, I'm so proud of you. Because I know that this is happening because you're inviting friends, you're loving on your relatives, you're, you're being the body of Christ in our community, and I'm just so proud of you. Well, we are starting this new series called I Am Strong, and if you're a guest with us, this series is, is a little bit different. It's really about pain and suffering. It's about how do you encounter God in your pain and suffering. And I, I know that in a movement our size, there's people right now going through cancer treatment, there's people with MS, with COPD, with Parkinson's. Pretty much every one of our families, if it's not us, someone is going through some kind of suffering, whether it's sickness or maybe it's the loss of a loved one or the loss of a pregnancy, the loss of a dream. Uh, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So this six-part series is really a pretty deep dive into scripture. Don't let the word deep intimidate you. Uh, it's not deep in that it's hard to comprehend. It's deep in that it requires your soul, your spirit, to kind of say, God, I, I want to learn these deeper truths about how to encounter you in my pain. In fact, today we're going to jump right in talking about the times when God doesn't answer prayer. And I just have to lead off with a little bit of a pastor joke. You know how dads have dad jokes? This is a pastor joke, right? The, the story goes that a, a family was gathered for dinner. They had had a whole bunch of friends over, and they had all worked really hard to clean the house and make the food, and everyone was a little stressed out from hosting. You know how that can go. And the dad, in moment of weakness, uh, invites his, his child, seven-year-old, to pray for dinner. Thought it'd be cute. The seven-year-old says, I don't know what to say. And the dad says, well, just say what you hear your mom say. And so the child says, dear Lord, why did I invite all these people to dinner? <laughs> so th there you have it, right? Your, your very own corny pastor joke for hopefully for the year, right? Hopefully that's out of my system. But I had to tell it because we are talking about prayer today. And just two weeks ago, we studied a really powerful verse where Jesus says, if you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be granted. And I described how I've, I've experienced this in my life. And yet, this doesn't mean that we always immediately get every single thing we ask for. And, and, and while we might, you know, just say like, well, okay, that's fine, the reality is when we're going through difficulty, especially when we're going through sickness or pain, and we pray and we say, God, take this away from me, heal me, and it doesn't happen. It can really shake our faith. So we're gonna talk about these times when God doesn't heal you. Now, some of you know a little bit of my story, and I wanna tell it because I want those of you who are going through suffering to know as we go through this series that I'm not like speaking as an observer, I'm speaking as a fellow participant in suffering. And a, a part of my story is, I'll, I'll just tell you sort of an anecdote of um, a, a key moment in it. It was when I had left my journalism career, Mel and I, we, we walked away from a career, good salary, benefits, everything, and we went to this church of 40 people up in the mountains of Arizona. 
I think I was about a year and a half in when this happened. Church had grown to about 120. It was December, and I was so all in for Jesus. I mean, I was just so all in. And with our 120 people, Christmas was coming. And I'd be saying, hey, invite your friends and your neighbors. Invite them to this powerful December series. Invite them to Christmas Eve. And uh, the Sunday morning before Christmas Eve, as I was getting ready in my office and I'm praying and I'm going over my notes, um, I started to see these little spinning pixels of light. Now, if you're a migraine sufferer, you know kind of what this is like. And I had had migraines where I would have that visual aura really since I was a teenager. And sometimes I'd get a little bit of numbness on one side, um, but that was, that was really as bad as my migraines had gotten at that point or as th those episodes. And so I start to see these little pixels of light. Well, in my personal life, I'd really been learning about faith and about prayer. And so I gathered the elders from our little church. I was probably 29, maybe 30 years old. I gathered them around me. I said, guys, I'm, you know, I'm starting to have one of these things, but I just, I believe God brought all these people here to hear his word. I believe this message is for them. Will you guys just lay hands on me? Will you pray for me? Just pray that God heals this thing enough that I can, you know, deliver the message. And they prayed and I prayed and I just had, had so much faith. So much faith that even though I was still seeing the little spinning pixels of light, I hopped up on stage with my notes, I had a little lectern, and I just started reading my message, just confident that you know, God was in this and that he heard us and that he was going to answer. And as I'm reading my manuscript, the people are looking at me really funny, funnier than usual, right? And I, I start to listen a little closer, and even though I'm, I'm reading in English, what's coming out of my mouth is these weird slurs, like from an inebriated person or something. And so I try to really focus and just say what I mean, and I, I can't get a word out without just these weird jumbled sounds. Uh, pretty soon that numbness on the one side just started to turn into this searing, burning pain. Some of those elders who had prayed with me kind of escorted me off the stage, they took me to the emergency room, and, and my body went through, in about the next 12 hours, all the symptoms of a, of a stroke while I was laying there in the emergency room. Uh, in fact, at one point, it started off that I could think words, but I couldn't say them. At one point, it got to the point where I couldn't think words. Uh, it's really hard to explain what that's like. It's like, I, I, I couldn't think my name. I couldn't think the word name. Like, words were just gone. Well, the emergency room you know, pumped a bunch of stuff in me. They kind of got me through it. They did scans and concluded it wasn't a stroke. I went to a neurologist, and he diagnosed me with this thing called a hemiplegic episode. Hemiplegic episode. And those started in that next year of my life to become more and more frequent. Um, not quite once a month, about every other month. But the thing that was really disconcerting about it wasn't just the physical pain. It was the brain fog. I would have one of these things, and then for about the next week or two afterwards, I could just tell I was not intellectually the same. I could sit through meetings, and I could answer emails, but I couldn't, you know, get up and, and do what I, what I do. And so I went back to this neurologist, and I said, hey, I'm in the prime of my life. These things are getting worse, and the brain fog's lasting longer. Like, what's my, what's my prognosis? What's my situation? And he more or less said, there's two tracks. Like, either you're going to figure out how to deal with these, your body's going to adapt, or they'll just keep getting worse. And it, it can lead to disability or a reduction of your ability to function. You talk about anxiety. You know, it created in me this, uh, this fear. Of, it was totally out of my control. Like, I can't control when these things come or not. And then as I started to think about what might this look like in the future, what if these keep coming? And I mean, my whole adult professional life has been words, either writing them for a living or speaking them for a living. And I can't even say words. At any moment, this ability to speak can get taken away from me. And so I started to study this passage of scripture that we're going to look at today. Because I'm not the first and you're not the first person of faith to go through a health condition or a loss that's beyond your control, to be crying out to God for help, and not get the immediate healing that you want. I want to ask you right now, can you relate to any of that? Uh, maybe not the specific condition, but 
something that you're praying for deliverance from. And the question is, what can you do when God doesn't heal you? What can you do when you're praying for him to fix the marriage and you're doing your part, but the other person just, they won't even lift a finger, they don't care. What can you do when you're praying for the cancer to go away and it doesn't? Or, or maybe, you, maybe just emotionally you've been in a state of depression or discouragement where you keep thinking, one day I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna feel good about life, but you cannot remember the last time you woke up and really felt good about life. Maybe you woke up today and you still felt the same way. Whether it's your health, your emotions, we all have these things that happen to us that are out of our control. And at least in my experience, there's the, the pain of the actual thing, and then there's the anxiety of kind of looking out over the upcoming years of your life and thinking, this, what if this just keeps getting worse? What if the marriage keeps getting worse? What if the child keeps pulling away? What if the, the health thing doesn't turn around? How do we deal with those? We take them to God, and then what can you do when he doesn't heal you? What can you do when you don't get that answer right away? Well, this is what happened to Paul the Apostle. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, in fact, Christianity as we know it, 2,000 years later, the largest movement in human history, really wouldn't have uh, exploded without this guy, Paul. And he was an all-out Jesus follower. He even changed his name. Like, his name was Saul. He's like, I'm so in for Jesus. I'm changing my name to Paul. He leaves a career. He leaves everything. And then he gets this physical condition of suffering. And he describes it here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He says this, there was given me, or I was given, a thorn in my flesh. Now, this word flesh is, um, it's a little different from the Greek word for body. It's literally like the word for your, your flesh, uh, your muscles. Your, this was a physical condition. And yet it's more than physical if you read it. In Paul's case, he says, a messenger of Satan. So we actually know for Paul, where did this sickness come from? Was God mad at him? Was God judging him? Was God saying, Paul, you don't have enough faith? It was actually the enemy of our souls, seeing the good work that Paul was doing, who sends this condition on Paul. And you also see that it's spiritual, it's physical, but it's also emotional because he uses the word torment. Now, I hope you're not in it right now, but there will be some time in your life when you go through something that torments you, not just something that makes you sad, but something that so breaks you down emotionally or physically or spiritually that you find yourself in torment. And when that happens, you need to know you're not the only believer to go through this. So what I started to do is I was, you know, on the one hand trying to learn how can I eat different, sleep different, exercise different, what can I do? God, heal me. I'm praying for God to heal me, but it's not happening right away. I chose to go deep into this passage because it's going to say some things that seem unbelievable, that seem hard to, uh, they're kind of like Christian bumper sticker slogans. You'll hear Christians say them, but I don't know if people grasp them. And I just decided if God's not going to heal me, I've got to figure out how to be like the Apostle Paul with my thorn in the flesh. So I wonder for you right now, just you and God, what's your thorn in the flesh right now? Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Would you just right now, would you identify your thorn in the flesh? Or maybe you're a parent and it's something going on with your child, physically or relationally or uh, emotionally or psychologically. Identify the thorn in the flesh in your life or in your family. And even right now, I would just encourage you over at Avon, online, right here in this room, just invite God, say, God, I want to experience you through this thorn in my flesh. Yes, I want deliverance from it. I want to be healed from it. I want to be delivered. But until then, Lord, allow me to experience you in that. If you would just pray that from the heart. I really believe that this week and in the next five weeks, Ron will be teaching part two next week, and then I'll be back I really believe God's going to do something in you uh, that someday you'll look back, whether from heaven or when you're older here on earth, you'll look back and you'll say, though I don't want to go through it again, 
I'm actually thankful that I did because of how it changed me. Uh, and that's, that's where I'm at now. Now, thankfully, over the years, God has kind of turned the volume down on those episodes. I get maybe one a year now. I haven't had to go to the hospital for one since I moved to Indiana. Um, he's turned the volume down graciously, but for about two years, it was torment. And while I never want to go through it again, it so changed me. And it, God has so used it to work through me to others that I, I actually wouldn't change that part of my story. And I think if you'll invite God in in that way, you can experience him in the same way, whether it's physical pain, emotional, or relational. Well, verse 8, Paul says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So here's this guy. He's left his career. Uh, he's given up wealth. He's given up being you know, fairly, fairly famous, fairly well-known in his industry. He's given up all that to follow Jesus. And now, instead of it getting better, now it's gotten better in that he's got peace, he's got joy, he's got purpose, he's got fulfillment, he knows he's part of something eternal, but his circumstances actually get worse. And so he goes to God in faith. And, and notice these words, three times for, for a Jewish person Praying about something three times was really symbolic. You may recall that when Jesus, son of God, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, about to go to the cross, he prays to the Father, Father, if there's any other way to forgive the sins of the world, if there's any other way to reunite humanity back to you, let this cup of suffering pass from me. How many times does he pray that? Three times. Three times. And each time he says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Father, if this is the only way through, if this is the only way to help others, I trust you. So Paul, following Jesus' example, he prays three times. Now, I don't mean that if you pray three times and God doesn't heal you, you should stop praying. Keep praying. I still pray for health, and, and, and often God answers it. But, but I've learned to trust, and that's what we're going to see here with Paul, Three times, look at, notice these next words, I pleaded. Paul wasn't like, you know, just at a kind of shallow level small group and like, hey, by the way, will you guys all pray? I've got this kind of like thorn in the flesh, you know? Um, and like, he pleads with God. And we know from Paul's other letters, there's this Greek word, agonizomai, from where we get our word agony, but it's actually a verb. Like, I'm, I'm in agony in prayer. That's how Paul would pray. Like, he's sweating, he's, you know, he's, all in praying, and the idea of three meaning to completion, and he pleads with God, God, I'm your servant. I'm trying to serve your people. I'm trying to do your work. Would you please remove this thorn in my flesh? Would you please take this away from me? And you'd think that Paul would get the answer he wanted, but here's the answer he gets. Verse 9a, but he, the Lord, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Not what we want to hear, is it? I'm going to give you, I'm going to sustain you through this. Why? Because my power, the supernatural power of heaven, the power that raises people from the dead, the power that speaks and planets form, that power is only fully experienced in your life through the passageway of weakness. Whew. I mean, that's one thing to accept on paper or in theory, but when you're in the torment of weakness, that's a really hard answer. God tells Paul the apostle, no for now and no for a purpose, no for a reason. A few questions that we should ask of the text because these relate to our lives. Is this answer because Paul had done something wrong and is being punished? No, it's not. Is this answer because Paul did not have enough faith? No, it's not. Does the pain in your life mean uh, that God has abandoned you? No, it doesn't. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that he's punishing you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have enough faith. Now, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. But I love it that God chose to put this in the Bible, that the the man through whom the entire New Testament church and Christianity as we know it would spring forth lived with a physical disability that tormented him, that had spiritual anguish to it. And and he experiences God's power through his weakness, not because he didn't have enough faith, Not because he was being punished, but because there's a real enemy of our souls. This world's broken by sin. Some of you need to know today that in your pain, God's not the author of pain. Now, there are times God disciplines us like a child. The book of Hebrews talks about that. But the vast majority of pain in the world goes back to Satan in the Garden of Eden who introduced death, dying, sin, sickness, broken relationship. And to me, it is no accident. That in this passage, for sufferers, it says it's a messenger of Satan sent to torment me. Now, could God have made it go away right away? Yes, he could have. Now, that's where we have to trust. Okay, God, I'm asking for healing and deliverance. If you don't give me that right away, I have to trust that you see things I don't see. You know things I don't know. And I'm not going to fall for the lie that you're against me or you're punishing me. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe you. If you say, God, that your grace is sufficient, I'm going to choose to believe it. And if you say that I can actually experience a, a quantity and quality of heaven's power that I never could if I didn't have this weakness, if you say that, I don't get it, I don't feel it, but I'm going to choose to believe it. You know, I've wondered sometimes, How long did it take Paul, great person of faith, more faith than I have, to accept this answer? Because that's one of the unique things. As you learn to read your Bible, you'll notice that sometimes a story that took 40 years or 100 years, it gets summarized in like a sentence or a paragraph. And we don't get every detail. Paul is going to believe God on this promise, and he's going to get to the point where he says, I look back on my thorn in the flesh and I'm glad I had it. But we don't know. Did that happen overnight? Probably not. Did that take a month? Did it take a year? I'll just tell you in my experience, it took me the better part of two years of me saying, God, I I choose to believe this. I don't feel it. I don't even understand. But you say this, and so if you haven't healed me yet, I'm going to I'm going to believe you. I told you we were going a little deeper. It's not hard to comprehend, but it's hard to to accept. It's hard to believe. And just when you can't believe some of these promises of God, pray that simple prayer. Lord, I believe a little, but would you help my unbelief? Fill in the gaps. Took me two years to get there. You know, just as God brings spring out of the cold of winter, he brings new life out of the old leaves that have fallen and died on the ground. He brings strength out of strain. In the same way, God says, trust your pain to me. Trust your pain to me. And I will bring something good out of it. Every mother knows the pain of childbirth. Not a pleasant experience, but worth it. Worth it. And it's a picture of the pains of this world broken by sin. If God allows you to go through it, he will bring good from it if you'll keep turning to him in it. I love that Paul, the writer of this text, he was a tent maker, like literally made tents um, to cover his bills when he would travel around helping churches. He would sell tents. And so if you think of a tent, an ideal tent, the fabric is, is waterproof. And the rain falls down and the water beads up and it runs down the side. And as I processed this passage and as I thought about Paul, the tent maker, and really tried to summarize visually, what's God saying here? What's going on? It's almost like this, okay? The pain in your life, the physical pain, the suffering, it's like a tear in the fabric of your tent, and it hurts. And what God kind of says to Paul is this, Paul, I'm raining down power and blessing onto your life, but your self-dependency 
is like a waterproof barrier. And my blessing and my power, they just beat up and they roll right off. And isn't this true in our lives? When we need nothing from God and we're all set and life goes on like that long enough, we pray a little less, we give a little less, we serve a little less, we become self-dependent. And Paul more or less says to, to Paul, I didn't cause this tear in the tent of your life. Satan did. And Paul, I will heal it someday. But Paul, I'm going to allow that gaping wound to be open for a little while. And if you'll trust me, what you'll experience is my power is going to flood into your life through the very thing you most wish you didn't have to go through. I wish it wasn't this way, but it is. And if you'll invite God in, because some of us have a lot of tears in our tent, don't we? If you'll, God, I want to experience, I want healing, Lord. I'm, you can ask God for healing every day, hundreds of times a day. He doesn't get tired of hearing it. He will heal you eventually. But surrender to him and say, Lord, until you heal this emotional pain, until you fill the hole of that loss, until you heal this broken body, I invite your power to come into my life through the gaping holes of my weakness. Well, eventually, Paul believes God on this promise, and look at the result. He says, therefore, I will boast. I'll be glad about. If there's anything I take pride in in my life, it's my weakness. Actually, my weakness is plural. Paul's now writing this years later, and he says from experience, this is how Christ's power rests on me. Paul, who, if you were to ask a, uh, even a non-Christian historian, give me the you know, top 10 most influential people in human history, Paul the apostle would most likely be on the list. Turn the world upside down. God's power through Paul's life, which by the way, Paul prayed for, right? God, I want you to use me in big ways. Well, part of that was there needed to be some tears. And even though Satan, the author of pain, caused those, God says, I'm so infinite, I'm so wise, I can use these things that Satan's trying to do against you. If you'll surrender them to me, I can actually use them to do good in you, to change you, change your character, give you a humility you wouldn't have, give you an empathy for others you wouldn't have. And then, Paul, not only will it change you and change the quality of your ministry, but it'll, it'll change the world. Paul gets so extreme in this. <laughs> Verse 10, sounds like a masochist here. He says, this is why. For Christ's sake, for the work of the kingdom in this world where Satan's still on the loose, I now delight. <laughs> sounds crazy, right? I delight in my weaknesses. I delight in insults. <laughs> I delight in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. You know, if you're a Bible circle or if you've got your Bible open, you could circle that word delight. I mean, that, right? This is weird, isn't it? The Bible, if you really study it, it's, it's, uh, it's curious. How could a person get to the place where they delight in, in pain? Now, Paul wasn't seeking out pain, and you shouldn't. I sure don't. He wasn't inviting it, but he got to the place where he trusted God enough to say, uh, Lord, I'd love for you to take this away, but I trust that if you don't, you're going to work through it. And then here's what happens. There's certain things you can only learn through experience. You know, God allowed me to go through my thorn in the flesh, and all of us will have them, right? These bodies will age because this world is not our home. It's probably not the last thorn in the flesh I'll have. But I did experience through it. Even though psychologically, physically, it was the hardest thing I've ever been through, I truly wouldn't go back and change it because it changed me. It gave me a humility in my marriage that there's no other way I would have gotten there. It gave me an empathy and a compassion for others who suffer. There's no other way I could have gotten there. Um, God allowed the, the book that I wrote about the experience. Tens of thousands of people have, have read it all around the country and the world. It's been translated into other languages. And you know, I get notes from people who say, this book helped me through. God used it. He'll use what you're going through to change you, to change others. He used what Paul was going through. And then here's Paul's conclusion, verse 10, second half. For when I am weak, it's when I'm weak, that's when I experience the strength of God. So maybe you saw the title of the series, I Am Strong, and maybe you thought like, oh, is this like a self-help, like, you know, I can get through anything? 
The irony is it's totally the opposite. God can get you through anything. And God can show off his strength and his power in your life through the things you most don't wanna go through, through the things that hurt, not through your highlight reel, through your low light reel. Remember, Paul writes this from a place of excruciating pain. And so now we get the answer to our big question, what can you do when God doesn't heal you? Here's one of the answers. There are many. <laughs> Fix your eyes on what you're going to when you can't stand what you're going through. When you're just like, I, I just can't make it anymore, I can't, then fix your eyes on what you're going to. God says, I'm, I'm taking you somewhere. Your, your pain, your suffering is not the destination. It's an uncomfortable journey, but it's not the end. So fix your eyes on where you're going. Believe that God will heal you in time, whether in this life or the next. And believe that until he heals you, he'll bring good from it. Now, this is one of many answers to this question. And as I've prayed for you all this week and really in the last month preparing for this series, um, here, here's what I expect will happen. We're gonna look into the Bible. We're gonna find a lot of answers to the question, what can you do when God doesn't heal you? How do you experience God in your pain? This is one of them. I'll give you a few more today. There's more next week. There's more every week of this series. And so for some of you, you're going to find an answer. There's going to be one answer that you latch on to that connects for your suffering or your personality and just invite God to lead you to that one. Let me give you four reasons why Paul could believe this really unbelievable promise of God. And there are four affirmations while you wait for your miracle. Because the reality is, if you've placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, this body, which Paul describes as a tent, is not your ultimate home. And the day will come when you wake up in heaven and your body will be perfectly healthy and it'll be healthy for 100 years, 1,000 years, 8,000 years, 16,000 years, and the pains of this world will be gone. So every miracle you pray for, for your health, for your deliverance from pain, will happen in Christ. The question is, will it happen in this life or not? Sometimes it does and it's okay to pray for the miracle now because, I mean, we've seen that in our church where we've laid hands on people and they've been healed right away. And, and that's a beautiful thing when God does that. Some people act like that's the, if you have the highest level faith, you'll always be healed right away. Hi, you know, that's great if you're healed right away. But you look at Paul the apostle, the highest level faith says, when I'm not healed right away, I'm still gonna trust God that my healing is coming and I'm gonna trust him that he'll bring good from it. And so this is affirmation number one. God will heal you entirely in time. Now, if you haven't yet placed your faith in Christ, this doesn't apply to you. And so I would encourage you to do that because what God promises is this. If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, when you die, you're not gonna wake up in heaven in the presence of God. Jesus came to connect you back to God. And so this is an affirmation for all who've, who've placed their faith in Jesus. If you haven't done that yet, you can do that today. You just say, Jesus, I believe you're God. I believe you died for me on the cross. Forgive my sins. Boom, you get adopted into the family of God. Your name is written in what's called the Lamb's Book of Life, the Registry of Heaven. There's a reservation for you in heaven. And in this life now, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you and comfort you through your difficulty. And the Holy Spirit, believers, if you invite him to affirm these things in you, the Holy Spirit, as you're going through suffering, will remind you, this is temporary. I'm gonna get you through this. The time is coming when you're gonna be in a glorified body. Paul was able to accept this difficult answer from God, no for now, because Paul knew this and he believed this. He knew that this life isn't everything. In fact, uh, seven chapters earlier in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul, the tent maker, describes your body and mind as a tent. And if you think of a tent, imagine a tent in your front yard and that that's what you live in right now in the winter months, you're in a tent. Now, over the course of years, what's gonna happen to a tent outside anywhere in the world, but especially in Indiana, right? The wind, the rain, the snow, it's gonna start to get tears in the fabric. And what happens, Paul says, these bodies are like tents. 
And when you get a tear in your fabric, it's okay to pray to the tent maker, to God, and say, Lord, heal me. And often he does. And he puts a patch on your tent. And praise God when that happens. He delivers us from the pain. It's a great thing. But think about it. Think about your house versus a tent, especially with the weather lately. Which one would you really want to live in forever? (laughs) Like, would you rather always have your tent patched or would you rather just pick up your sleeping bag and go inside? And God, who's bigger, kind of says, you guys are attached to your tents, literally, okay? (laughs) There are bodies, but trust me, trust the God who transcends time, You've got, you know, 60, 70, 90, 100 years in your tent. Moving out of it's uncomfortable. But as soon as you wake up in my presence, you're going to be really glad you did because no more more tent life. No more patches in the tent. In other words, your pain in this life is temporary. Your pain will get better. It will pass. It's amazing what we can endure when when we know that it'll end. I got to see this this last week because my son Jack, who's 13, uh, his, his new teeth, his adult teeth are coming in, but there were like seven baby teeth that would not surrender. They wouldn't give up the fight. And so the dentist kept doing x-rays and the dentist finally said, we have to pull seven teeth or his adult teeth can't come in. Now, as soon as she said that, I thought back to a time when he was five and I had to take him to the emergency room And um, just to get a saliva swab, he put up the fight of a lifetime. I mean, they had to get about six nurses. They had to strap him down. He was spitting on people. They got their saliva sample, all right. Like, and I was thinking, okay, he's bigger, he's stronger now. Like, let's see how this goes. But of course, I explained to him as a 13-year-old, this person's trained, they're a professional, they know what they're doing, it's going to be uncomfortable, you know, they're going to numb you up, and even that is, it's, it's uncomfortable, you're going to feel pulling, all this, but you can trust them, they know what they're doing. And sure enough, he, he sat there like a champ. I was so proud of him. I, I was watching, I had like a front row seat, I'm like watching them pull the the teeth out, and I thought, what a difference from age five to age 13 that now he comprehends, I can trust these people. And do you see the similarity as you go through this temporary life? God doesn't want you to suffer. Suffering is not gonna be your eternal state. It's not gonna be your destination. But sometimes a tooth has to be pulled. Sometimes in this broken world, we will have to go through uncomfortable things. And just like a good doctor, a good dentist, who's well-trained and they have your best in mind, you can trust him. And within it, you can trust this difficulty I go through will be healed in time. After, well, let me give you something, guys. I wanna say this together out loud. I'm gonna put it on the screen. It says this suffering will end and then I'm gonna do like a one, two, three. But before we do this, I want you to just gather yourself spiritually and just like choose in your spirit to believe this. You don't have to feel something to believe something. And so I'm gonna count to three, I'm gonna say it with you. If you're choosing to believe this, we'll just read this together, okay? Here we go. One, two, three. This suffering will end, okay? You need to know that. What you're going through, it will end, okay? Sometimes that's all you can hang on to. There were times in my suffering that was, that was all I could hang on to. You know, I I remember thinking through the worst case scenario when the neurologist said, it might just keep getting worse. And it's like, okay, so what? Am I gonna, because half my body goes limp when this happens. Like, so if I end up in a wheelchair and I can't talk, what's Mel gonna do? What are the kids gonna do? And, And as uncomfortable of as a thought as that was, I realized this world's temporary. If that happens, it'll be temporary. And that suffering will end. And God, but what about Mel? What about the kids? Well, if that happens, I have to trust that God has a plan for Mel and the kids. And God has a plan for the church I was leading at the time. And I just had to trust that, like, I don't want to go through it, but if God allows me to go through it, he's got a plan, and it will end. Affirmation two, God will use your pain for a purpose. I'm not going to fully unpack these. The book unpacks these a lot more. But remember, God said to Paul, my grace is enough, my power is made perfect through weakness. And so, you know, there's a purpose for it. And it takes faith when you can't see, God, what's the purpose? 
likely the purpose is in you. There's some things that are going to change for the better. It'll also be through you. It might be that where you've been praying that God would fix your marriage, you don't even know the blind spot you have in yourself, and now there's this other pain in your life, and you're like, God, make it go away. And he's like, I will eventually, but if you'll trust me in this pain, it's gonna humble you, it's gonna change you, and you're gonna get the fix to your marriage that you've actually been praying for. God might be answering something that you're praying for through a pain that has been allowed into your life. John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so there's something, I'm I'm just gonna put this phrase on the screen, the book goes way deeper into it, but I call it the myth of problem-free Christianity. Very common in American Christianity. Many American Christians have this uh, idea, I think it's the way it was presented to them, I trust in Jesus and I won't go through anything hard, but Jesus didn't say that. That's not the Christianity of Jesus or the Bible or Paul the Apostle. It's not problem-free in this world. Uh, You could put it this way. Jesus doesn't promise you that if you believe in him, all your problems will go away immediately. He doesn't promise that. So don't let it shake your faith when you still have problems. However, better, he does promise all your problems will go away eventually, and then once they do, that's your eternal state. Way better than living in your front yard in a tent and always just getting another patch, right? Because you patch a tent, it's gonna tear again. You patch it again, it's gonna tear again. And God loves you enough to say, I'll give you some patches, I'll get you through, I will sustain you, I'll work it for good, but I'm only gonna let all this go on for so long. Eventually, I'm just gonna bring you home to myself. And then all your problems will be gone. And that takes faith, doesn't it? It takes faith. So I'm gonna give you something else you can repeat aloud with me. I'll say it first. God will bring good from this. But again, I want you to just kind of, if you wanna gather your soul, your spirit, choose. Think about what you're going through. Think about God. Think about his promises. And just make make it a choice right now. I'm gonna count to three. We're gonna say it out loud. One, two, three. Three, God will bring good from this. Okay, he promises you that. He promises you. He's gonna bring good from your cancer. He's gonna bring good from your miscarriage. He's gonna bring good from that person who abandoned you. He's gonna bring good. God's not the author of evil, but what does he promise in Romans 8? He works all things together for good. You think of a cake that is super tasty. What are some of the ingredients? Raw eggs, flour. You take those ingredients by themselves, you want to eat a stick of butter, right? Like those ingredients alone do not taste good. And Satan has made a lot of the ingredients that we encounter in our lives. God is so all powerful, and this is going to be part of his glory in eternity. We'll look back and we'll say, even a super powerful supernatural being like Satan, who tried to destroy your creation. God, you're so good that you could take his salt and his butter and, and all, all these terrible things, you could mix them together and work all things for good. You can trust God. Even when there's pain in your life, he'll bring good from it. Affirmation three, God will sustain you in your suffering. God will sustain you. And in this series, we'll learn many of the ways that he does. Next week, Ron's gonna unpack one of the ways that God, he's just gonna get you through. What does that look like in real life? We'll learn a lot more next week. Remember, God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient. So here's our next thing we're gonna say out loud together. God will get me through this. I'm gonna do the one, two, three again because I really want you to just picture the thing, picture God, choose to believe. Here we go, one, two, three. Three, God will get me through this. God's gonna get you through this. Affirmation four, you will experience power when you trust God with your pain. This is where, you know, it it gets, this is why Paul said, I actually delight in my weaknesses. It sounds weird, but I mentioned, if I could go back, I wouldn't change what I've been through. I've got a friend named Joy. I'll tell you more about her in future weeks. She's been in a wheelchair for about 20 years. Um, She was the first reader of this book, I Am Strong. Uh, She had an accident. She was a fit, attractive, young mom, a car 
accident, paralyzed from the waist down. Joy has told me to my face. I visited to see her in New Mexico where she lives. John, if I could go back and change the accident that paralyzed me, I wouldn't. Because I have so changed inside. I was insecure. I looked great on the outside, but I was insecure. I didn't know who I was. Now I know who I am. I know where I'm going. I have a purpose. I'm secure in God. And it sounds weird. But if you'll invite God into your suffering, the day will come, maybe in this life, maybe in the next life, where you look back and you say, though I don't want to go through that again, (laughs) I wouldn't change it because it changed me and it helped other people. And so here's what we're going to say aloud on this one. I choose God and his power in this. Okay, so again, gather your, your spirit, your will, and I'll count to three. And if you mean it, we'll say it together. One, two, three. I choose God and his power in this. Now, I'm looking out on a room, and there's a dear brother here who's going through a cancer battle, and I can't look him in the eyes or I'll tear up. Uh, There's another brother in our movement, Brian. Uh, Here's a picture of Brian recently. He's part of our mini marathon group, and he's been posting on social media. He can't run right now, but he still meets up with the group before they go out on their runs, and he encourages them, and he's clinging to Scripture. And here's the thing. You're in a movement right now where you're surrounded by people um, who are learning to do this. And I think if we'll all help each other out and if we'll all lean into God's truth in these next five weeks, we're gonna see God change us in, in some just deeply profound, supernatural ways that we could never um, work up or imagine. And the day will come that we'll all look back on all our sufferings. And we'll say, God, I'm so glad it's over, but I see what you were doing. And I'm so glad that in my suffering, I didn't turn away from you. And I got to experience that your power comes into my life through my weakness. Let me pray this for you right now. Father, in this place and at Avon and online, Lord, I love your people so much. I don't want them to hurt. I know that you love them even more. You don't want us to hurt. We thank you that we are delivered from evil through Jesus' work on the cross. God, why have you left us here in these tents? Well, there's a whole lot of people who don't yet know you. There's a whole lot of people we need to to bring into the mansions that you've prepared for us. So God, right now, over every sickness, over every pain, I, I do pray, if it's your will, if it would be for the best, that you would deliver, that you would heal, even miraculously. I've seen you do that. I know you can do it. And God, where you don't do an immediate healing. Make us like Paul the Apostle in our faith, that when you say my grace is sufficient, we believe it and we learn to experience. When you say my power is gonna invade your life through this, that, that, we would, that we would invite it. So God, we invite your power. Those affirmations that we said out loud, we believe them. Help us to experience them. Change us to be more like you, Jesus, and, and use us in this broken world to put our arms around other sufferers. Bring them to you, we pray in Jesus' name.